Welcome to Academic Forum Series 4, Motivating Students for Online Self-Learning. Today, we have the pleasure to have invited some prominent guest speakers from not only Hong Kong, but also Singapore and Malaysia to join us. They are going to share their insights and research regarding how to motivate students to learn on their own online. We will have a total of four sharing sections, followed by a panel discussion today. I have no doubt this is going to be a fruitful afternoon. Before the forum officially begins, may I invite our Vice President, Professor Ricky Kwok, to give an opening address. Professor Kwok, please. Thank you for uh, having me in this uh, <clears throat> very uh, important occasion. Uh, Dr. Samuel Ju, Dr. Linda William, Mr. Roger Shingham, Dr. Benjamin Chen, our Dean, guests and participants. Welcome to the Academic Forum Series number four, Motivating Students for Online Self-Learning. Please allow me to give my sincere thanks to our honorable speakers on behalf of the Open University of Hong Kong. And I'd like to take this opportunity to share with you that the Open University of Hong Kong will be renamed as the Hong Kong Metropolitan University with effect on September 1st, 2021, a few weeks from now, with the Hong Kong uh, Government's Legislative Council's approval. The Li Ka Shing School of Professional and Continuing Education, uh, we usually call it uh, Li Pace, as one of the six constituent schools of the Open University of Hong Kong has always strived to provide quality vocational and professional education at the post-secondary level. It performs complementary but vital roles in fulfilling the university's founding mission of providing education for all, as evident by the extensive range of disciplines covered and studied levels of our programs. Now, in the past 18 months, we all have witnessed a global paradigm shift in teaching and learning mode due to the COVID-19 pandemic. To adapt to new demands and needs, online learning has become ubiquitous and has never been more crucial in ensuring the contribution of students' learning progress against all odds. In fact, Many now believe that the pandemic could potentially exert profound and lasting effects on how education will be delivered. It is precisely against this uh, very, very unprecedented backdrop that we gather here today for this forum. Take part in this uh, initiative and exchange ideas to underscore the importance of motivating students for online self-directed learning. We are indeed honored to be able to invite distinguished educators like Dr. Ju, uh, Dr. William, and uh, Mr. Singham to the forum as part of the celebration of the 30th anniversary of our school. They will be sharing their valuable experiences and research, I believe, on facilitating students' self-learning in this milestone event. I firmly believe that through the sharing sessions and the subsequent panel discussion, we will all benefit from the results, insights, and findings of these evidence-based studies between Hong Kong, Malaysia, and Singapore. Finally, I'm sure the forum will be a great success, and I'm sure all the participants will have a rewarding afternoon i also like to take this opportunity to wish you a nice weekend. And I'll just stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Kuo. Please stay online for the distribution of certificates to our honorable guests. Since we're physically all over the world at the moment, we're going to have a virtual exchange of certificates today. We will send the certificates to the guests later. First, may I invite Professor Kwok to give a certificate of appreciation to Dr. Samuel Ju from the University of Hong Kong for his support of the forum. Hi, Sam. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Nice, uh, nice to see Kong. you here. Nice to see you again here. Nice to see thank you. you. Thank you so much for your help. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thanks for the certificate. 
Now, may Professor Kwok give the certificate of appreciation to Dr. Linda William from Tamaska Polytechnic in Singapore. Hello, Dr. William. Thank you so much. Hello. Yeah. Thank, Thank you for you. your sharing. Yeah. Look, forward to, yeah, look forward to uh, hearing from you. Hey. Uh, thank you. My, uh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me also. Thank you. And then we have Mr. Rajah Singh from, from BAC Education in Malaysia. May Professor Paul please present a certificate of appreciation to Mr. Singh. Thank, thank you, Mr. Singh. Thank you so much for helping us. Oh, great being here. Thank uh, you. It's, 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 a, it's a great well. opportunity to learn from you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now let's take a group picture virtually together. Now, without further ado, we'll soon start the sharing sections. For the first presentation, we have Dr. Samuel Drew. Dr. Drew is an associate professor at the Faculty of Education in the University of Hong Kong. He obtained his two PhDs in e-learning and information science. He was head of Division of Information and Technology in Hong Kong U from 2013 to 2016. He has published over 340 articles and books, and with a staggering 82 of them appearing in international academic journals. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Dr. Ju and others have published a paper about online teaching specific for the context of the pandemic. His topic today is how we may motivate various levels of students for self-learning via gamification, from kindergartens to master's students. Dr. Ju, please. Thank you for the very nice introduction. Professor Koch, Dr. Benjamin Chen, uh, and all. Uh, my topic is about motivating students for self-learning via gamification. Okay, so please put in the uh, pin 6681670. Ah, now, and then the, oh, I, I need to go back to my PPT for those who, who didn't get a chance to scan this. Yeah, so please make sure that you scan, you scan this. Yeah, and then the, and then you type in the pin. All right now, so the this is the pin. Yeah, then you answer. The, okay, now I guess we'll wait for one more person. Okay, okay, okay. People are still joining. Uh, maybe a little bit more. Okay, very good, very good. Uh, many many people are joining. They really want to hear from your thinking. Okay. Wow. Okay. I think we I think we need to uh to continue once we pass 50. Okay, okay, now we'll start. So let's see. Let's see what you think. Yeah, can students learn how to read from primary one to primary four on their own uh, with little intervention from teacher or parent within five months? Uh, can they learn four level, uh, four level of uh, reading, four years of uh, learning, learn it in five months on their own? Can they? Let's see now. So we still have a. Uh, so you just click on the, uh, the, the yes, no, or maybe. Let me see. Okay, okay, I see. So six, five. Four, three, two, one. Okay, let's see the answer. Okay, okay, very good. Wow, okay, most of you believe that uh, yes, students can learn four years of curriculum on their own within five months, reading curriculum I'm talking about. And it's interesting uh, to learn that uh, uh, some people think uh, no, and then uh, some people think maybe, okay. Now, with this very interesting introduction from you, uh, and uh, I'll continue. Now, this, this boy now is a, a senior secondary school student. He was a primary school uh, four student when he joined us sharing in this earlier vi video. Uh, now, so, so let's learn from, um, from what, what his mom and him uh, said uh, in a sharing. Okay, here. 
All right. Okay. Enjoy. Oh. So the mom is was crying. Looking for tissue paper. Okay. Uh, now, the mom uh, in, in an interview uh, told me that the uh, son, before using a gamified reading platform, a reading battle, uh, he was reluctant to read any books. Even at kindergarten level, he wouldn't read it. And so he was way behind because he's already a primary four student. Uh, now, but because of uh, the gamified platform, um, and then he started reading. Well, that's what the mom said. He started reading at level one. Level one is primary one, uh, elementary one in Hong Kong. And then in just five months, he caught up. The mom said, level one, two, three, four. So he self-taught himself four years of reading curriculum in just five months. Now, how was it possible? Now, the mom told me that uh, one day, his son bought home 16 books. Now, he didn't do it every day, not even every week. Uh, but I, I actually checked his record for the second semester as a primary four student. He has finished around 50 books, but that 50 books already changed his life uh, upside down. Now, and then uh, you can see that, uh, oh, sorry, some of you may not know uh, Chinese now. So he, he was once uh, pretty poor academically, including reading, but because of this reading platform that has changed him. Uh, and, then, and then here he's talking about uh, his life as a secondary school student. And, um, and because of the reading platform, then uh, uh, his Chinese uh, ha has been number one uh, in the entire secondary form. And he was even becoming the, the school journal editor. And for English, he's also within top 10% of the students. So this is really amazing. Now, so with a proper gamification, then the magic can happen. <laughs> We can change the students from reluctant readers into book lovers, just like magician. Yeah, just like uh, what uh, David Copperfield, that uh, he seemed to be able to fly through rotating hoops. Now, this is uh, the reading battle that I developed and released. That was uh, in February 2014, more than seven years now. Now, if you like, you can uh, uh, go check it out. Uh, and here's the website and then here's the uh, username and password and students they need to read a book whether online or in print first before going to this reading battle gamified QA system uh, question and answer system let's say a, a child has read uh, this book this is an online book and by the way, this is by one of the top achievers uh, in reading battle. He wrote this book probably as a primary three or four student. Uh, and his book uh, has been read by over 500 times in just two weeks after we load it uh, on, the, on, on here. And then, the, okay now, so after someone has read the book, yeah, then the student will then come to reading battle. Uh, 
uh, to to do the battle, to do the challenge. Huh? And then here's the gamification rule that uh, each book can be attempted three times. The second time will have a 10% deduction. Second time, uh, the third time will have 20% deduction. Every question can be answered twice. Now, why, why do we give people three chances? Now, in terms of uh, uh, the content, I, I, I'll show you now. So in terms of the content, it's just reading comprehension. Um, in general, reading comprehension is pretty boring for students. But when we gamify it, then you change the whole thing that the students don't feel uh, pressure, don't feel that they're taking an exam because to take exam, you only have one chance. But in here, as long as you try, as long as you work hard, everybody can, can, can be good, can be ranked on the leaderboard. Huh? Um, and, and that's why it, it allows all students to have success rather than the, uh, to have a winning student uh, and the losing student uh, who score low. Uh, in here, everybody can be a winner. Okay, now, and, and uh, now there are four kinds of questions. Uh, this is uh, information retrieval, the lowest kind, uh, the lowest level, uh, low, low order thinking question. Uh, but that there are also high order thinking questions like uh, inferences, integrating ideas and evaluation. Uh, and it is exactly because of the more challenging questions that push the children to work really hard. Uh, in the past, uh, um, many parents and children told me that uh, they, they read a book when they're done or they put it aside. But with reading battle, they, they cannot do that because uh, for many of the book, if they just read it once, they cannot tackle uh, quite a few questions. So they have to read it again and again and maybe talk to parents, siblings and friends. And then it is during that process that, that they learn fast. Uh, and uh, when they answer a question incorrectly, we'll provide a hint. In education, we call this scaffolding support. And then down here, there's something called worm catcher. This is designed and invented by me. Um, what, what it is, is actually uh, a bug report, a problem report. Now, if you just call it problem report, nobody cares because it is not fun. But then if you call it worm catcher, uh, then it catch the attention of the children and then they want to be worm catcher, having have some fun. And the Chinese term for it is uh, that means uh, you can be an expert in catching worm. Huh? Now, this is for primary school students. No primary school student will be regarded as an expert. But in here, they can earn the status to become an expert. And to earn that, they have to work really hard. They have to read the book really, uh, really well in great detail. When they answer the question, they answer the question like a critic. So they, they, they read at a higher level and so they can improve so fast. Now, and then when they answer the question incorrectly, then the, uh, an explanation will be given to them immediately. Immediately feedback is very important for learning. And then here's a complete profile of the child's reading journey. So parent and children, uh, parent and, and teacher can learn about the reading ability, habits, and interests of their uh, children, student, and then make uh, their, revise their intervention, their teaching method accordingly. So everything can be very tailored to the particular student. Now, and then that there are three kinds of leaderboard. The leaderboard in general is the biggest driver. Um, in a gamification system for users. And I designed three kinds of leaderboard. Huh? Now one is a life score, that means from, from day one to now. Huh? Yeah. Uh, now, so what we are looking at is the life score ranking. And you, you can see different name uh, and then the different form. Now this is the primary three, primary five. Uh, some has no, uh, no level because they've already graduated secondary school students now. And then different school. And then here, number of books. Now, this is really amazing. Uh, some students have answered more than 500 books and quite a few more than 400 books. And then getting average scores 90 something out of 100. All these are genius. Uh, all these are, uh, I'm pretty sure many of them are going to be scientists, doctors, lawyers, eye bankers, etc. Uh, or hopefully some will become great educators. Uh, 
Um, now, we need to understand that uh, these are not homeworks, okay? Now, most of these activities were done on a voluntary basis. Now, that's the magic of gamification. You don't need to force students to do this. Students will do it on their own. This is mainly, I would say 80% or more self-learning. Okay, why reading battle, this platform can work like magic? Because it can satisfy the basic essential psychological needs of the student. According to DC and Ryan, they designed something called self-determination theory, SDT, in which there are three elements, autonomy, competency, and relatedness. When students have uh, find satisfaction in what they do uh, in these three areas, then they will put their heart into it and do it very diligently. Autonomy means uh, they have choice. They are not told, you do this today. Well, that's homework or, or exam. And then the competency, they can see that they are improving, not just getting a score from an exam. And relatedness, meaning that uh, there's a social dimension. They can see how others are doing or they can discuss with others regarding what they do. Now, so um, we actually have published a paper a very recent one in British Journal of Education Psychology uh, Technology, uh, and in which uh, it talks about three study uh, that we, we did in relating to my talk. Now, so here uh, we survey the student, the teachers, the parents regarding students' level of, uh, what, what, why, why, why reading battle uh, work? Uh, yeah, uh, now because uh, students, um, and also teachers and parents, they, they do feel that the, uh, the student, the children have fine interest, find interest in reading battle. And also that, that they use it pretty frequently. And also that uh, they, uh, they have a lot of choices. Uh, so choices, they satisfy autonomy. And then, the, um, and then the, uh, vocabulary speed uh, is talking about that they can see that they, learn more vocabulary, they can read faster. So this is competency. And then the um, social gaining. Uh, now, so they all feel that, uh, well, quite a, quite a few uh, of the parent, teacher, and students feel that uh, they, they actually uh, can gain socially through uh, this uh, reading platform. Now, and then the, one of the students, uh, student Wong or student Gordon that you saw earlier, now we asked him, uh, and then he said, uh, uh, his reading choice became richer uh, because there are 11 genre of books. And so this is uh, satisfying the, um, the autonomy. And then here about uh, through reading book, competing book battle, students strengthen their reading ability. So this is a competency. And then lastly down here, students social interaction were enhanced uh, because of reading battle. Uh, quite a few students and parents said that uh, uh, there are social elements uh, uh, during their uh, children's use of reading battle. Uh, here talks about uh, a mom uh, talk to uh, her son. Huh? Now, and then, now this uh, student Gordon, uh, up here, he was a primary four student. Down here, I think he was a secondary three and now secondary four. And he said, uh, so reading battle really changed him uh, quite a lot. Uh, that um, here he talks about uh, how you offer uh, autonomy to him, how you offer, yeah, again, autonomy, different kind of books. Uh, and then he talked about he can, he can read from easy book to difficult books, so that, that is uh, an increase in his competency. And then he explained why autonomy is so important. Uh, now he said um, for many uh, teachers or, uh, or parents, uh, they, they, they may push you to read, hey, this is an award-winning book. This is a textbook, uh, really good, huh? go read them. Now, this is okay, but then we also need to give uh, a lot of freedom to the student regarding what they like to read. Huh? Uh, don't stop them huh? unless it's really something really evil. Huh? Um, otherwise, let them develop their interests. Huh? 
Now, and, and because of the way that the school and also the uh, maybe the parent uh, taught him, he, he said he hates reading books. Uh, now, but then, but then the use of feeling better really changed him from hate reading book to become a book lover. Uh, so he formed a good habit uh, and also uh, developed a competency uh, in reading. And okay, relatedness. Now then, the, uh, again, this same student, he said that he can see other students' uh, score on the ranking. And then, and then that provides him a motivation to catch up. Uh, and then through that catching up, then that offers him a, a big satisfaction. Uh, and then uh, here talks about how he tried to complete his homework um, quickly so that he can uh, ha have time to do reading battle. Uh, uh, okay. And then even difficult books, uh, then he would, he would read now. And then he said, uh, uh, because of that, then his academic uh, performance has improved a lot, uh, whether it's reading or writing uh, or other subjects too. Now, and then here he also shares something really interesting that uh, uh, don't, don't, don't just uh, uh, do reading because of academic improvement. Uh, he said the academic, uh, he, he, he shared that the reading actually bring him a lot of uh, uh, benefits. I, I, I didn't put it down, he, he talked about how it helped him develop creativity. The creativity is something that uh, many Chinese or Asian students lack. Uh, so uh, something like this, because it encourage kids to read very broadly and also uh, challenge them in four different kinds of uh, questions. That's why it really helped them develop uh, their creativity, critical thinking, problem solving. Now one, one critic, uh, criticism I always got is, uh, hey Sam, you are harming the student. Why? Because what you are doing is just working on the extrinsic motivation. That's not right. We should help our students to be intrinsically, uh, intrinsically um, motivated, not extrinsically motivated. <laughs> I always got this kind of criticism. So I actually did a study on this. Uh, uh, and, well, uh, and, and also that another criticism is, uh, uh, once students don't have your platform, they will go back to normal. That means uh, uh, they will uh, read at a very low level like before. So I did a study on this and see whether it really happened. Now, so um, in here, uh, we have students who have stopped using reading battle on average for about 13 months. And then the, now here, period one is uh, before using reading battle, period two is during reading battle, period three is after stopping using reading battle for more than a year. Now you can see that the, in, in terms of intrinsic motivation for reading, okay? But you actually, now this student actually were pretty low to start with, but then during reading battle, then it become very high. Uh, and then even after more than a year, it remains still pretty high, huh? although quite a few drop a little bit. Huh? And then uh, regarding reading ability, um, reading ability, now then the, uh, you, you notice that, the, okay, originally it's uh, pretty low uh, and then the shoot up high, down a little bit. No, actually continue to be good. Huh? And then for the habit, reading habit, now there are two indicators, frequency and book choice. Started low, becoming high, and then drop a little bit. Huh? A reading interest, start off low, and then the, uh, Become, became really high and drop just a little. Now, so, um, so the myth that the gamification uh, will, will not work uh, once you take away the platform is not true. It depends on how we design the platform. Now, uh, gamification is an art. It takes a lot of skills, um, a lot of knowledge regarding education, how people learn, motivation, psychology, uh, uh, design science, many, many knowledge. Uh, so, it's, it's true that not, not every gamification system will work uh, and, and also work to the extent that I'm describing. Huh? Uh, now and then here talks about that, uh, okay, now why can the positive effect on reading battle uh, sustainable? Now quite a few students mentioned that uh, they in fact start using reading battle 
for extrinsic motivation like ranking or award. But then because they discover that, uh, wow, the books are actually pretty interesting. And also that they can learn a lot from the books. And then the, many of them change from low performers into pretty high performers. And then the, the teachers, uh, the, uh, the classmate, uh, family members start to, to, to look at them differently. And, and then of course they, 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 they really want to continue uh, to enjoy uh, this kind of treatment. So um, hardly any of them will, will be co and go back to normal. Huh? And then uh, now what I said earlier was a perceptual uh, improvement. Now here I present you with uh, uh, the actual improvement, actual reading score improvement. Now, so there are two groups in here. Uh, so one group uh, that uh, uh, use uh, reading battle uh, frequently. The other group use it very little. So we compare these two groups. And then the result shows that um, uh, those who use it a lot as compared to those who hardly use it. Now, they improve in their reading ability score uh, significantly higher than the other group. Now, and then the, uh, uh, besides uh, gamified reading for primary school students, I also have a, a gamified uh, a system for kindergartners, iPhone reading. I also have gamified a system for secondary school students regarding sex education. It also involves a lot of reading. Um, and my colleague and I have done some work at the university level, yeah, how we gamify university courses. Uh, now, basically, uh, all this uh, uh, do work um, uh, similarly uh, to what I um, shared earlier regarding uh, my experience uh, in primary school. Now, I like to conclude with a question. Why can a gamified learning platform like Reading Battle can motivate students to self-learn? And also that I like to sing you a song. Uh, and when you listen to the song, I like you to think, how, why is this song or certain idea in, in, in this song relate to what I said earlier? Okay. 明月光, 為何都不大懂得努力體術對方大門外有色術回向卻如同彎角上會託上會託就當重新手托手去上學堂 OK, now, in what way is this song related to what I said? Now, it talks about uh, children. Now, what they enjoy uh, is the park. Uh, what they like to fix their eyes on are things like comic, uh, uh, not, not the award-winning books, uh, <laughs> not the textbooks, okay? Yeah. Uh, now, so as educators, what our job is uh, to help our children to have a learning environment, just like a park, as fun as a park. Give them learning materials, as fun as comic. Uh, we can do it uh, through gamification, but of course we need to do it properly. And there are lots of uh, uh, learning uh, behind. Uh, it's not something very simple. So thank you. One more. <laughs> now, um, what I showed you was a reading battle 1.0. Huh? And uh, so earlier I, I already uh, gave you accounts that you can try. Um, now, and uh, reading battle 2.0 uh, is a lot better than reading better 1.0 in terms of uh, the design, uh, how interesting it is. And also that the reading better 1.0 um, is for primary school kids only, mainly. Huh? But for 2.0, we also cater to kindergartners and secondary school students. Uh, and then uh, I am also designing reading better 3.0 now, and that will be a collaboration between human and artificial intelligence, and that will be ready next year. So if you're interested to join any of this, 
uh, please uh, scan this code and then uh, leave me uh, your uh, your choices. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. G, for his sharing on the incorporation of gamification. We have a question here for from one of the participants for uh, Dr. Ju, and that is um, gamification is an important part of the future of e-learning and self-learning development. Uh, but do you think students at all levels can participate in ga gamification? So, for example, uh, what about tertiary level students? Thank you for the question. Uh, earlier, I mentioned that, uh, in fact, several years ago, my, my colleague uh, uh, and I, together with some other colleagues, have already tried, uh, tried it at uh, university level, mainly master level. But I'm pretty sure you also work for uh, undergraduate. Uh, um, that. Uh, with proper application of gamification, students will work harder. Yeah, basically, uh, uh, that's the idea. And also, not, not just work harder, but uh, they find more interest, find it more interesting regarding uh, what uh, what they have to learn. Yeah, so so the answer is definitely. I, I do believe that uh, gamification in general uh, can work for all level of students and also can work for almost all subjects. Yeah, because everyone likes to have some fun. Why not? Huh? Thank you very much, Dr. Ju. And now we will come to the second presentation of the day by Dr. Linda William. Dr. William is a senior lecturer in the School of Informatics and IT at Tamasek Polytechnic in Singapore. She was awarded her doctorate from Singapore Management University. She is an expert in machine learning, artificial intelligence, and data science and has published over 50 articles in reputable journals, conferences, and books. Her topic today is keeping up with the fast growing technologies in data analytics. Dr. William, please. Uh, thank you very much for the nice introduction. So let me just share my screen. Good afternoon, everyone. Greetings from Singapore. Uh, so my name is Dr. Linda William. I'm from the School of Informatics and IT, Temasek. Temasek Polytechnic Singapore. So before I start with my uh, with my with my sharings, I'm going to actually share a little bit background about why we actually have this. So um, uh, it, for today's talk, what we what we're going to do is I'm going to share how our experience and how we use a LinkedIn Learning to help our students to keep up on their data analytics skill. For uh, before they go for an internship, so internship is like a uh a, a, a subject, a mandatory subject that every students need to actually take. So uh, we so in here so do, in this talk we're going to share a little bit a little bit how we actually uh how we actually uh ask them to to do the uh, to do the uh self online learning, and then. We're also going to share some of the feedback from the students. So uh, before that, just a little bit about Singapore, uh, about Temasek Polytechnic. Okay, so Temasek Polytechnic, or uh, we usually call it TP for short, is uh, one of the polytechnic in Singapore. It's located in east part of Singapore. It's established in 1990s, and since then, we become one very awesome family. Okay. Uh, so now we have like 37 full-time diploma courses across six academic schools. Uh, we have like over 14,000 full-time students and also part-time students. So these part-time students uh, keep increasing the numbers. So, okay, so for me, I'm from a school of informatics and IT. So in the in this school, we actually have like 1,700 full-time students and 600, 600 part-time students. And as I mentioned, the number is keep increasing, especially for the uh, part-time students. We have uh, six full-time courses or diploma, uh, the including the new diploma, uh, diploma in applied artificial intelligence. So we also have like a common ICT program. Where the first year of the first year of student do not need to choose their diploma yet, so uh, they can choose their diploma after they go to their, sec their second year. So uh, in this school, we also uh, supported by 
more or less 81 school time stuff. So for, my, for me, for myself, I come from the diploma of big data and analytics. So our uh, sharing is mostly is about big data and analytics and how what kind of skills and how we use the LinkedIn learning uh, to support our our students uh, in to acquire the needed skills in the big data. Okay, so now let's talk about data. We are now living in the area of data. Data is everywhere and more of it is being produced all the time as the organizations are aggressively collecting large volume of data, both structured and unstructured. Here is some predictions from IDC. So, uh, IDC predicts the global data sphere will grow to 175 zettabytes in 2025. And 30% of this data will be a real data, real time data. Global data sphere is the combinations of organizations and also customers' data. There we can imagine how big is the data will be. In 2025, it is predicted that 70% of the world population will interact with F with data every day. So each connect each connected person will have at least about 4,900 connections per day. So in terms of uh, minutes, you can actually see that the interact uh, there will be like one data interactions every 18 seconds. Many of these interactions can will come from uh, billions of IoT devices, just like our watch, our phones, and so on. And these uh, IoT devices will be connected across the groups, which are expected to create over 90 zettabytes of data in 2025. So, okay, so now we understand that we are all live in the era of data, have a lot of data. So, what's the impact? What would be the impact? So. Uh, the impacts uh, the impact can be can be seen from the point of view of organizations and also the job markets. So, in the point of view of the, the uh, in the point of view of organizations, data will become a center of digital transformations for all organizations. Data gels with the technology; it will become the main driver of the digital transformations. It will actually drive the people, the process, and also the technology. Data will also give a tremendous impact to the organizations. We can consider some of the companies or some of the organizations that are already like uh, well-known, such as uh, Netflix, Google, Facebook. These companies are gathered and analyzed large amount of data, of customer data, to offer new content or product or optimize their applications, their operations. While other companies such as hospital and healthcare provider also use the data to find a new ways to administer service and help more people. These organizations that rely on their reach of data sources to make their products better, we call this one as a insight driven organizations. Most of the time, the insight driver organization will prepare, will perform better than the companies that just uh, that just consider a gut feeling. According to Forrester, inside driver organizations are now growing up to 30% annually, eight times faster than the global GDP. Collect collectively, they are set to make a 1.2 trillion by 2020. So now what's the impact in the uh, in the job market. So the job market is also uh, influenced by this uh, era of data. LinkedIn recently identified that data scientists and the data engineer as two of the fastest growing job and skill in US job markets. In 2020, it's become uh, two of the emerging jobs in US. Data scientists has a 37 of annual growth while data engineer has 33 percent of uh, annual growth these two job roles are actually have a uh, overlap skill set with the data analytics okay, this emerging job markets are also 
can be seen in the Asia job market. If we take a look at the data analytics, data analytics platform, these are some of the examples of the data analytics platform that organization use today. It's actually a combination of a different, uh, different tools and technology. So for, uh, so for the data itself, it will, the data source itself, it will come from a different, uh, different data, different resources such as the cloud, the third party data, and also on premise or their own data. Then from the data, then uh, technologies to do the data preparations and then in memory engineering and so on are used. This advanced, this advanced technology are usually help to do the automated insight, automated insights and also outlayer detections to to enable companies or to enable organizations to find out the insight faster and sooner. All of this all of these insights or uh, uh, our outlier or uh, alert can be seen in the visual data discovery and also the dashboarding. Dashboarding will, will actually include uh, interactive dashboarding where people or user can actually um, change or drill down or view the data based on their one. These are some of the examples of the data analytics platform that we have today. The technology in the data analytics, as what we seen in the previous slides, are, are constantly changing. It's very dynamic and change very fast. New technology and all tools are released every almost every month. Let's take, for example, this magic quadrants for, uh, for business analytics and for BI and analytics platform. Every year, there are some changes in it. New tools are emerging and existing tools are being replaced by others. So a few leaders in this uh, magic quadrant for now is like Microsoft, Taboo, and Click. These are some of the tools that we actually teach in our diploma. However, next year, this magic quadrant may change. Because this magic quadrant is from uh, 2020, so even like maybe end of the end of this year, this magic quadrant may be changed because the new uh, features or new tools may be introduced, and then uh, and it will actually replace the existing features or existing tools. This actually create the challenges for us, especially for students. Uh, to keep up with all the growing technology, especially when the students wanted to go for an internship. The internship company may actually have a newer technologies implemented, so they need to keep up. Uh, what are the technologies needed for their internship? To do this, due to these reasons, we try to complement our classroom teachings and learning with online self learnings to keep the students up to date with the current development. Okay, so if you go to like, uh, for example, if you go to uh, uh, LinkedIn Learning, then you just Google data analytics, you actually will get like a lot, a lot of courses. So this is just a one example. Then this is the keyword is only data analytics. If we actually use like a more uh, tool specific keywords, such as uh, Python's, or Tableau, or ClickView, and so on. So then we will have like more, more courses. So this online, this online courses actually have a lot of courses related to data analytics. Other online learning platform also have uh, courses related to data analytics. So uh, due to this, um, this uh, rich content, in the online learning, so we actually turn to uh, to uh, online learnings to help the students uh, for to prepare for their internship. Okay, so let's me just jump straight to the case study. So what we actually do is that uh, we implement this uh, online self learnings to for the students in their final year. So the so in our curriculums, right? Uh, so every every student would need to go for an internship. In the year three, 
they are going to go for an internship in a company for around 20 to 30 weeks. So they're going to be attached to a company and they're going to do uh, the tasks related to big data and analytics. Okay, so because this one is like year three, so some of the students already learned the concept and then the, the concept of the data analytics, big data and so on in, the, in from start from their year one and year two. So sometimes they may need like a refreshment before they go for the internship. Or we also wanted to introduce a new concept, a new tool, a new technology just before they go to the internship so that they become prepared for uh, to work on the big data and analytics job. So that's why before the students go to the internship, we actually have a free SAP training modules that the students need to complete. This uh, pre SIP training models is carefully designed or selected to prepare the students to work on a big data and analytics related job. Before the COVID-19 strikes, before the COVID-19 pandemic, we actually do these pre SIP training modules uh, as a face-to-face -face or as a classroom uh, as a classroom training. But due to a uh, COVID-19 pandemic, so we turned into a, a online, online self-learning uh, to do this pre sap training modules. So how do we do this? Uh, so there, we actually list down all the, uh, all several courses that we want our students to take. So uh, we list down eight courses related to big data and analytics and also seven courses related to the soft skill. These courses actually carefully selected based on the data analytics trend and then also based on the requirements from the companies. So based on that, then we actually come up with a list of uh, pre-selected training courses. Then from out of this list, do they need to come three to four courses in the list and submit the certificate of completion. Then the student will have around one month to complete the whole course. So this is an example of the, uh, of the courses that the students need to take. So it's ranging from Excel, the data visualizations, SQLs, Pythons, uh, and then Tableau, Tableau, and so on. So based on this, right, the student, since the student need to complete it within one month, so uh, we actually managed to get most of them complete the module. So based on last year result, 95% uh, of them actually complete all the modules, while I think 5% of them uh, do like maybe uh, two or three modules. I think I only have like around... Uh, one percent or one student that actually on, didn't do anything. So, because, uh, so we actually asked all of them to complete the models, and then based on that, ninety-five percent of them complete the models. Then, uh, because we also asked them to give us the uh, the certificate, so this certificate actually help us to verify whether they already complete the uh, the courses or not, and also give us the that of completion. So those, all of this can be, so all of their uh, learning can be documented and then verified. Okay, so these are some of the uh, feedbacks like, that we often, like, that we get from the student. So they do think that the pre assessment training courses, we give them, uh, help them to polish their skill, basically then to deepen their understandings on a certain tools and on the certain tools and technology. Then the pre sap training also gives them some soft skill and hard skill. Then uh, throughout the modules uh, that they already attend at the Temasek Poly. Then the, another comment is that the pre sap training, it's provide them a stronger base for their skill. So essential skills such as Excel data visualizations are reviewed. Then it will help them 
during the internships. Okay, then another one is also say that it will actually help them or to perform uh, the job that are given in their company. Okay, so um, based on what we have, right, we actually, uh, uh, we actually try to reflect and then we come into a, like a four lessons and some important success factor that we, uh, that we actually uh, summarize to, to have like a high participation in this online self-learning. The first one is that maybe because this uh, online self-learning is part of their overall internship grade. So in our, in our diploma, the internship is graded. So uh, the free SIP training is part of that overall, uh, overall grade. Then the second one is a flexibility because we give them an options to, to do three or four models based on the list that we have. So they have uh, more flexibility in like uh, taking what are the models that they think will be more relevant to their internships. If they find other list of courses that are more relevant for their, for their uh, internship, they can also uh, suggest or suggest that more uh, set that courses and then ask for the for our approval. The second one, uh, the third one is a constant reminder. Well, we actually give a lot of reminder to our students to complete this online set learning. So uh, we often, I think it's like not just like two or three times. So we give them a constant reminder. So I think almost every week we give them a constant reminder. And nearer to the date of uh, submissions, we give them more uh, reminder. Then the last one is the relevant courses. Because the courses that we have, or the, the courses that we select for our students is actually based on the, based on the current uh, data, based on the current data analytics landscape. So they can see the relevance between the courses and then the skill that they need for the internship, do uh, because of that, because of that uh, alignment, that they are more willing to actually do the uh, the courses online. Okay, so yeah, uh, this will be the end of my sharings today. Okay, thank you very much. I will welcome any questions that you have. Thank you, Dr. William, for her insightful ideas on keeping up with technology. We do receive. We do have. A question here for Dr. William, and that is, um, as a teacher or as an educator, what is the biggest challenge you face when using technology to motivate students? Okay, uh, one of the biggest challenge that we have is that uh, how uh, is that how the how the how we can actually ask the student to see the alignment with what we actually uh, with all the model or courses that we ask them to do online with what they already learned and also what they actually need in the future. So if they actually understand those alignment, it will become easier for us to motivate them to do the online uh, self-learning. Thank you very much, Dr. William. Thank you. We'll now move on to the third presentation. Mr. Rajal Singham will be presenting on the topic Learn Different, Next Gen Education. He is the founder and managing director of the BAC Education in Malaysia. He is a dedicated educator, entrepreneur, and social leader, envisioning making an impact on 10 million lives by 2030. Mr. Singham has a countless experience in public speaking and holding talks. We can't wait to listen to him. Mr. Singham, please. Hi, uh, thanks so much. So great to be here. Thanks for the invitation and uh, really learned a lot listening to Dr. Sam and also Dr. Linda. Uh, so, and I'd like to thank everyone who's attending today. Um, what are we looking at today? We're looking at learning a different way. Um, for many years, the system of education we have has really been outdated because it was a time for the previous industrial revolution where it was mainly preparing people or students to work in factories. These days with automation, artificial intelligence, most of those jobs can be taken over by 
robots or uh, using automation and artificial intelligence. Hence, there is a need for us to look at things differently. Uh, this just gives you an idea. I'm not going to spend time on this. BAC actually is an education group comprising a whole range of different entities. And we have 30 other companies in the group and we run a lot of different activities. A key element of our being is to look at education right from primary school to secondary up to university levels. And a lot of, we have about 200,000 students currently studying with us who are studying with us for free, uh, including our digital workforce programs, uh, free education for school children, and so on. And we work with 250 NGOs because we seriously believe that uh, it's a responsibility of corporates as well as education entities to do their best uh, to work uh, for the betterment of society in general. So a lot of what we do is tied to the UN SDGs. Um, we have a very collaborative approach to doing things, and these are some of the partners that we work with from universities around the world. Now, every sector that we are in is being disrupted. So whichever area you're in, so if you look at retail now with the move for online shopping, if we look at uh, education with the online education, and as uh, uh, Dr. Sam was talking about gamification in education, if we look at uh, legal services, again, the increase in uh, artificial intelligence in legal services, uh, the link between law and using blockchain for a lot of things that, you know, smart contracts and other areas, uh, transportation. So everywhere there's disruption. But one of the sad things is because of the way education is and it's very regulated, it's sometimes difficult for the changes to happen as fast as they need to. Now, this is a key uh, figure uh, by McKinsey that between 400 and 800 million individuals will be displaced by automation and needing to find jobs by 2030. And this is actually a huge responsibility for all educational institutions around the world to make sure that we are prepared for that transition. Now, at the end of the day, you must understand that human beings can adapt, we will change, and we will get there. But there will be this transition, that gap between, you know, that sort of skills gap between when this happens and when we transition. And what we've got to do is to try and reduce that gap as much as possible so the transition can be done smoothly. And there is a need, therefore, for education institutions to change. Now, if you look at it, there are lots of jobs which will be lost. There will be jobs that will be changed. And there will be new jobs that will be created. And it, for us, we cannot continue doing what you know we have always done as universities or schools is just to prepare people for what we think they need. There is a need for us to actually see that our customer is actually not the student. Our customer is actually the employer. Or in some cases, when a student starts his own business, like a startup, okay, is that environment where he's going to operate that startup. So we need to change drastically and look at new ways of doing things. Uh, because it's only a 20-minute presentation, I'm not, example, simple examples of jobs lost in the old days, you have toll booths with people sitting in them, that's gone. Uh, there are, you know, other jobs which are manual, which can now be replaced by, uh, easily by robots. Uh, jobs changed is the nature of how, even if you look at a teacher's job, just as much as last year, they were teaching in classrooms and now they've changed more to do all the delivery online. So that's the nature of a change and there's some level of upskilling that is required or reskilling. Now, for us, these are the most important things when I look at it. How we're going to look at the future is to learn. We've got to constantly be learning. Lifelong learning is going to become more and more important. And that's where platforms like LinkedIn Learning, these kind of platforms which offer you tons of content, and I'll go into that in a while, are going to be crucial. A key thing is, because the rate of change is so fast, every one of us is going to have to think, how are we going to be relevant? So I give you a key example. Companies are becoming irrelevant faster and faster. The lifespan of companies have reduced from what used to be a 50 year, 60 year, and 100 year, but now in the S&P in the top, the 500 companies is now down to 15 years. I remember in, in Alibaba, uh, Jack Ma's uh, company, they talked about one of their key things is to be around for 100 years. So how do we stay relevant? Darwin put it this way. It is not the strongest, nor the most intelligent of the species that will survive, but the one most adaptable to change. Hence, every one of us, whether you're a student, whether you're a university professor, whether you're an educator, whatever, whether you're a footballer, you're going to have to sit down and see, how am I going to stay relevant? The pace of change is so much greater these days. 
And you've got to ask yourself, okay, how am I going to constantly learn? And how do I stay relevant? So for me, a key thing to, to bring out today is this. Every one of us who's listening here, think, how are you going to make sure that you stay relevant? Your learning institution, your, your, yourself as an individual. You know, so whether you're a country or company or an individual, you have to see how you're going to stay relevant. And the other thing I'm going to go through all the stuff on this is competencies. We are moving very much to a very competency-based approach. So other than what you study at university, generally with all the, you know, the subjects, start looking at what are the competencies you want to have. And these are some of the skills where, you know, if you look at LinkedIn, uh, LinkedIn learning, you look at uh, articles in Forbes and so on. These are some, this is a, not an exhaustive list, but these are some of the skills to look at. Adaptability, that means the ability for you to keep adapting to new things. Analytics, you have to have an analytical mind. Business acumen, no matter what you're doing, whether you're a doctor, a lawyer, uh, you know, whatever it is, an accountant, whatever you're doing, there's a need now to have some commercial sense and business acumen. Collaboration, we all think historically in terms of being competitive, but we need to move more towards a collaborative mindset. So collaboration is another key skill. Creativity, critical thinking, cross-cultural competencies, as we start moving and doing more trade, so like in ASEAN, there are 10 countries, or you know, you're looking at doing more trade between, say, Malaysia, Hong Kong, China, Japan, these kind of Korea, you got to start looking at how to respect and understand each other's cultures. So cross-cultural competency will be important. Curiosity, design thinking, digital, leadership, which I think is one of the most important uh, uh, um, competencies that people need. Multilingualism, to be able to speak different languages. Though we do understand the fact that now with new translators and so on, I could speak in English and it could come up in Mandarin or Cantonese or, you know, or Hindi for that matter and vice versa. But it's still a key skill to have. New media literacy, understanding social media, the new media, the TikToks, the Facebook, the Instagram, which is becoming more and more where the Gen Z and the millennials go um, now. Problem solving, project management, social and emotional intelligence. A key thing now for the youngsters is emotional intelligence because it's a very much different world from the one we grew. We can't understand it sometimes as older people. Transdisciplinarities, this is actually talk about multidisciplines. One of the key things I also want you all to just throw out there is try to become a polymath. A polymath is a person who looks at things beyond their field. I think the, the most famous polymath in history was Leonardo da Vinci. Um, so if, for example, you study, look at uh, music, look at art, look at you know something different, sports, something that takes you out, because it's actually scientifically proven that being a polymath really you know, increases your ability to be creative, to be innovative, and to contribute to society. So those are things to look at. Now, LinkedIn Learning is part of our next-gen education package. And they've got about 17,000 uh, uh, courses and videos and on a wide range of areas from digital marketing to data analytics, uh, as uh, Dr. Linda mentioned just now, to leadership, to strategy, finance. And we found it as a very good tool. And about a year and a half ago, we actually incorporated into our, get our staff to have it and our students to have it. And uh, these are just some of the figures, courses completed, videos viewed, about 130,000. It's about a 500% growth. Uh, in the last year, but we are now pushing and embedding it into more programs and getting it on board. Although all students have access to it, um, I, one of my staff actually uh, I just got into the Malaysia Book of Records for doing 200 over courses on his own and uh, uh, was was given recognition. Now, for our most popular courses are like things like Excel. This will give you a better list. Excel was number one, leadership career management. So students use it to help them navigate their careers, social media marketing, uh, productivity improvement, decision making, and then time management. So these are actually picked by students. Uh, we now prescribe to them courses on a weekly basis, but this has not been made part of their formal assessment. So they still have their formal assessment. Now, during the pandemic, one of the key things we looked at was how to change how we did things. So that's when Learn Different came in because we noticed study students were all at home. Teachers were teaching them from home, online. And how we're we going to ensure that experience was there. So we felt that we had to reimagine how education was delivered. And we came up, although we were doing a lot of these things before, but we came up with Learn Different. It has four pillars, learn, play, work, and impact. 
And we figure with these four pillars, we have everything covered. So when it comes to learn, they actually have a full hybrid campus. They move seamlessly, depending on whether they're control, movement control orders or whether you can go to work, between a face-to-face -face and an online campus. And they can choose to study either mode. So it's flexible and it's seamless. We set up Abacus, which is a full digital library with millions of pages of content, and it's 24-7 access, video libraries. Uh, you know, So we've, they've got everything from uh, HS Talks to LinkedIn Learning to Lexis to Westlaw to uh, Coursera, so they get much more access. We then work with a global faculty. So we got teachers from some of the leading universities in, around the world to teach our students live at different times. So all of a sudden, we've got lecturers from universities like Oxford or Cambridge or London uh, coming in to also deliver lectures on a weekly basis to our students, which change the experience. Uh, then we have VAC Learn, our e-learning platform. Students, we also did tie-ups with Microsoft and AWS uh, so, so that our students can actually hook on and have classes through our Coursera and LinkedIn types and take VR courses as well. So there's a possibility now for them to do micro-credentials from a lot of the world's universities packaged with our program. And Back for Life is our lifelong learning. So the moment they finish, they graduate, they're there constantly and they can learn. Then comes play. Now we have campuses, we have got, you know, they've got access to football fields, you know, football, they've got basketball, and but all of a sudden everything was stopped. So BAC Engage was set up as for 30 clubs and every activity that we had to run physical was then, you know, rethought how do we do this online? So from competitions from PS4 to Dota competitions to online dating to, you know, to, to uh, um, taking everything, uh, online talent shows, we reinvented the whole thing and we have Monster Fit where we're running all our gym classes, yoga, you know, you know uh, what do you call it? Uh, dancing, hip hop, everything and the exercises and the workouts went online as well. So again, we had to reimagine what we did physically and then see how we could do it online so that the play side, now nothing beats a physical campus, nothing beats you coming there and doing, but what we felt is we had to do something uh, in order to make sure that that interaction was there. So 150 online activities were run and come September, we're actually launching our own race platform for 60 events where students can take part in, you know, a, a marathon, a, a walk, everything from anywhere in the world. So our students who are now studying their final year in the UK will be able to take part in a competition with the students in Malaysia or Singapore or Hong Kong. So that changed it. Then came work because this is the most challenging job uh, market in the last 50 years. I mean, for Malaysia, that's a key thing. So we set up grad jobs, a job portal for graduates from all universities you know, in the country. We set up special jobs, which is a job portal for the special needs community. Then we also had back to work, a virtual internship platform. So now multinationals and other companies can give virtual internships to our students. We launched Project Apprentice uh, with now 130 apprentices taken on board. And they are now working where they work three hours a day on community and charity, you know, community type projects and the other parts, they're actually learning. So we give them further skills, additional skills, and the growth. Uh, Project Deep is our digital enterprise employee program. We're training 10,000 people for free for a digital workforce, and the same for Project Entrepreneur. So this third element or third pillar was to get our kids ready for work or to get them ready for their own startup through the Project Entrepreneur to set up their own business. And the last one is impact. Because we feel what's very important for the future is we tie impact projects. We, run, we used to run about 250 projects a year, but the idea here is we have the Make It Right movement and we work with 250 NGOs running community projects. So for example, Free Makan, which you see there, uh, was a food bank we set up in June because it, things were bad. From June 1st, Malaysia has been in lockdown for 60 days. A lot of them, migrant workers, refugees, and others from the B40, the low-income community, were actually having problems because they sort of live on a month-to-month -month basis. So we gave out actually provisions for 80,000 people in the last 50 days through Free Makan. Uh, COVID fund is because of the rising COVID cases. We have set up a fund to help hospitals. So like today, we donated 10 concentrators. On Monday, we got another batch. So things will go out. And under Give Back, we launched this. And our students get a chance to get involved in these things. So the key element 
is actually four things. Learning, playing, looking at the work element and impact. And the idea is then it is more holistic than just purely having an LMS and you know delivering online platform. We need a more holistic approach to things. And this year, we actually won the Technology Award for the Best Online Education Provider and also the ASEAN Award for our initiatives in combating COVID. So these are all you know, various uh, uh, things we've looked at. But uh, that about wraps up my 20 minutes. Uh, the, my phone number is there, but I just noticed it is uh, missing a six. It's 017 My email is right next to the phone number. Do feel free to, to reach out if you've ever got any uh, um, questions to ask. Somebody will probably dump in my number in the chat. Uh, so it's 017 And thanks, uh, thanks so much for having me here. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Stankham. We do have a question from one of the participants here, and um, that is, how has the pandemic changed learning? And what do you think stakeholders can or should do to address the disruption to learning caused by the pandemic? Uh, OK. I think the key thing is we have got to look at what we were doing earlier and when, when everything was done in a physical sense and see how we can replicate all of that. So for example, like in our case, now they come in, it's an online, you know, recruiting is done online, marketing is online, there's an online orientation, they come in for classes which are online, even the, the, the entire experience, the research, how, what is available online, their games. So the whole thing is to reinvent and reimagine everything, to say, well, earlier they had all of these things, and how do we make sure nothing is left out? And then the other thing to remember is this, we got to start from zero. What we were doing earlier may not have been the best way to do things. So where the gaps are, like getting them more competency-based, increasing their levels of skill. Uh, so to me, a key aspect is this, fast-track skill acquisition. What we need to teach our students is the ability for them to constantly learn on their own. Because whatever we teach them is going to become irrelevant faster than ever before. So we need to teach them how to learn and how to fend for themselves. You know, we call that the back for life thing. So you keep learning. So that's basically it. That's fair enough. Thank you very much, Mr. Sengha. And now for the final presentation today, we have our own colleagues from OU Lee Pace here. Ms. Joyce Wong and Mr. Ken Cho will be presenting on their pilot study on student preference and optic of online self-learning. Joyce is a lecturer here at Lee Pace. She is our program leader in tourism, ramp management, and airline studies, and her research interests include technological development, e-learning, and et cetera. Ken is an assistant lecturer who coordinates the pre-work integrated learning course. He is also a member of the working group on promoting online self-learning courses. Let's hear what their research results. Thank you, Heidi. So on behalf of my teammate, I'm honored to introduce our pilot study about the student preference and uptake of online self-learning to all of you. First of all, while we are setting up our learning learning working group in a deep pace, as there are so many researchers discuss about how to motivate students for online self-learning and the effectiveness about the learning style. Nowadays, some of the students refuse to be passive learners. They are not just satisfied to attend the class. And also, they refuse to just get into the lectures, or even they will drop notes for the examinations. Therefore, we would like to set up a truly online learning culture for students to help them in this COVID-19 pandemic. Also, the number of students experiencing education disruptions is increasing every day. Our class has been moved from traditional classroom into the virtual classroom. We found that the student motivation of learning is becoming very low. And no interaction at all as well. So how we can help the student? Some of the student is acting really passive learning and also usually waiting for the answers. In this case, we would like to achieve student-led learning rather than the teacher-led learning. We're looking for a platform 
that can support our active and passive learner at the same time. So we want to use LinkedIn learning to implicate it in our course curriculum as well. So why we choose LinkedIn learning as our self-learning platform? Let me tell you more about LinkedIn background. The demographics show that LinkedIn has over 575 million users and more than 260 million monthly active the users account. It's the largest professional social networking in the world as well. At the same time, our students tend to be paying more attention to the career earlier than before. As you can see, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Malaysia are using the LinkedIn account increasingly. Besides, LinkedIn learning includes breadth, depth, and quality content. It offers more than 16,000 courses in seven different languages. The on-demand library includes the latest business, technology, and creative skills as well. Perhaps hard and soft skills. More importantly, we believe that the content and speaker are professional and meet world class standards. It's also an easy to use platform for students. In addition, students hope that to learn self learning platform must be provided on demand and the barriers to access are low. For them, learning is not limited just in the classroom, but somewhere at their home. Lastly, LinkedIn is a tie-in platform. Since many already use LinkedIn daily, LinkedIn learning just fit into their existing behavior. Before we kick off this pilot study, we have references other university practice. For example, we have an interesting example to share with all of you. The pilot is from the Ontario University that provides access just in time, skills focused. And the pilot study reflects a brand learning workshop as well. A group of students that's from transportation engineering Organizing the workshop and use LinkedIn learning to meet students' self-learning outcome. Moreover, they will see the LinkedIn video first, and then after that, they will bring up some ideas and exercise back to the classroom and for sharing. Let me summarize the effectiveness of this Ontario brand workshop to all of you. I have three highlights here. The result of the survey indicated that 63% of those respondents did not have the habit to self-learning. And 50% respondents did not have the experience in using LinkedIn learning account. The result also implicated that 75% of the respondents actively helping their peers through this workshop. It encourages interaction between students and teachers. And it is usually not found in the formal and traditional classroom. The last one I, was, well, I want to mention is a student that comment the increasingly frequent for online tests or online quiz. This is really amazing and interesting because they can help them to stay focused, self-improve, and confident in their self-learning process. To sum up, most of the students and teachers are satisfied and willing to use LinkedIn learning in the future. After review the Ontario study, our university, LePace, want to work with LinkedIn learning to help students to build up strong, academic futures and prepare for recovery after the pandemic. This pilot study is a small scale of study. It is to explore 
how we can achieve the purpose of self-learning through LinkedIn learning. The pilot study includes three phases and six steps. Because using LinkedIn learning is a new normal in our campus, we also want to analyze and check the effectiveness of the student perspective. Later on, Ken will tell you more about the research. In order to achieve our short-term goal, we have two steps here. First, is to give prioritize to our students and teachers to use this platform. Let our students to use anywhere, anytime, or in their house. Step two, assign a new online learning ambassador for each program to assist the student if they have any inquiry. For the medium term, we have three steps here. The first step is more to enumerate learning barriers. We create different communication channels, for example, WeChat or, uh, or email account so that the student can find us easily. In the long run, we are still working on it because um, this is related to build up their LinkedIn account and to build up their networking through LinkedIn Learning. Here, we, have, we can share with you some achievements that we have been done. It's surprising that all students and teachers from six departments and more than 2,000 students activated their account in a month. The ambassadors are from six departments, which is healthcare, early childhood education, business and tourism, psychology, culture study, engineering, and fashion design as well. In, in the midterm, in order to in, eliminate learning barriers, we divided our students into two groups. One is passive learner, and the other one is active learners. Linear learning provides users with a collection function. Active learner can choose their personalized or specific content recommended by the teachers, making it easier for learners to build up their skills themselves. We also provide interesting topic, up-to-date monthly theme, so active learner can usually enjoy it a lot. Another useful function I want to share with you is the LinkedIn Learning Path, which is a university-based guide learning function. Teachers can create their own learning path for the student, and the passive learner can use it with the teacher guidance. So the learning path can, get, can guide students step by step, and also on the right time. On your right hand side, this is an example that is for passive learner to use the learning path. And a colorful table so below is a collection function that the teachers can suggest to the active learner to use frequently. Now we come to the other goal for our children. We have created a comprehensive communication channel with user-friendly language sharing functions. It provides student link, email reminder, or other functions to remind students to learn always. We have WhatsApp business group, WeChat groups, and hotline to answer student questions. Finally, we can check their effectiveness and student usage report at any time through the management function and dashboard. This is, a, this is an example where you can view the most popular course and skills inside. Our students are also interested of the communication skills, emotional skills, and leadership skills as well. Last but not least, we are still continuing our project. For the long-term goal, we want to achieve that our students can enjoy hunting journey. We recommend that students implement four-star points. Starting from the activating your LinkedIn account, 
visiting the LinkedIn homepage at least once a day to see what other people are posting, like and comment, so that you can make it yourself more active in LinkedIn account. Of course, don't forget to watch the LinkedIn video by yourself. And after you have done the video, you can collect the certificate and post it into your LinkedIn account. Your future career employment will be watch your LinkedIn account as always. So that's all for my sharing of my pilot study. I hope all the students and teachers enjoy to use LinkedIn Learning as your self-learning platform. Now I will pass my mic to Ken to share with you all about the funding from our focus group. Ken, please. Okay, thanks for that. Thank you, Joyce. So we've been talking about the changes we've done due to COVID and the closure of school. But now we cannot blame COVID for everything. So we ought to think about the pedagogical implications for using the online platform to improve our teaching and learning. So now we have been running this for a year. So we are, we are, we are now in the process of reviewing our feedback, how the learners really taking it all in. So very obviously, we need to be realistic at the moment as we cannot expect the students just pick up our pace and magically fall in love with the new way of teaching and learning. So I expect they will be slow or gradually take in the idea. So what we've done here is quite a small scale qualitative research. So what we want to know is what they really think about this change, the way of learning. So we get a small students focus group. We invited 11 students from various majors and disciplines. So we have healthcare major students, we have early childhood education students. So they're all first year, year one, sub degree students. So things they do have in common is that they're all quite new to tertiary education background. And they're all quite new to uh, LinkedIn learning. So the first thing we are interested to look at is the uh, previous education experience of the students, uh, whether they are already used to self-learning or self-directed learning. So not out of my expectations, they are, as they're all first year students, so some of them are fresh out of secondary school education. So the education experience is quite traditional or uh, teacher-led. So these are some of the direct quotes from the students. So they do not have much self-learning experience, not to say self-directed learning experience. So it will appear that it is quite a new concept to them. So what they will expect or what they're used to do is you just go into the classroom and listen to what the teachers have to say. So one students honestly say sometimes teachers was asked us to do the quick reading, but I honestly wouldn't do it. Well, sometimes I do this sometimes when I was a student before. So in short, the curriculum or the way of learning and teaching is quite traditional and faculty driven. So we mostly have teachers, what we used to do is what we have um, mostly the teachers talk and we decide what to teach and what they learn and do, they do not have power in what they're going to learn. So on top of that, I would suspect the students are not entirely happy as they can't go into the classroom these two years and handle their friends or even get to meet or know uh, know them, know their friends as they are first year or freshman students. So with limited interaction and contact, I would suspect the students are quite tired of looking just the screen or just the teacher on the screen in, on the computer at the house or on the tablets or the phones. So I expect sort of some um, resistance in such early stage of um, early stage of uh, implementation of using LinkedIn learning in our teaching. But to my surprise, some of them are quite open to the new idea. So these are, again, some direct quotes from the students. So they honestly say, without a little push, we will not watch or we will not know more about LinkedIn learning. So we watch more, we learn more, and I wouldn't mind. Uh, we will not know when, when it will become in handy. So it's difficult to know what, what it would be used of so we can learn, start learning right away. So we can see that they are quite open to a new element in their learning, but they would um, expect some kind of guidance with it. So I'd like to stress that we are not just here to promote the use of LinkedIn Learning, but LinkedIn Learning is just one of the many tools to force the blended learning approach. But this kind of open learning platform does come with several advantages. So these are some comments from the students. So say, so firstly, so it offers rich contacts. 
that can supplement with our um, with our courses. Like one business student say saying that he can learn additional knowledge about business presentation because he's a, a business major student. It provides great details and the videos are easy to follow because the videos are broken into very small um, small chunks of um, two or three minutes videos. So there are, there are also lots of topics to explore, hence the topic variety. And there are sometimes little quizzes after each part of the video. So some students would take it as a challenge. So they so they kind of having fun in between the videos. But of course, it wouldn't just be a replacement in our teaching activity. As the students would point out that this LinkedIn learning, um, the LinkedIn learning resources, there's still a limited interaction in between. So I personally do find the human touch in the classroom teaching very important. So on a different note, in the data collection process, uh, one student asked us if we could also use LinkedIn learning as well. So at this point, if the teachers could genuinely introduce the resources, instead of simply asking the teacher, asking the students to work on the task, it could really help out the ease, ease out their resistance. For this to happen, teachers do need to set an example to try out the new tech by themselves. I personally use LinkedIn learning as well, and I do like using it. So we are not here to shove it down the throat saying you have to use it. It's course mandated, it's part of your assignments. So we want them to use it. I think we ought to believe it's a useful tool for myself as well. So therefore, I would adopt these three E models. So I would first explain the importance and the significance of using the resources on the platform. So we cannot just force the students to use LinkedIn Learning. So we need to explain and show them the benefits or the advantages into using it. And then we can move on to the execution evaluation part. So we uh, adapt to the curriculum change or we modify our course content into the use of uh, LinkedIn Learning platform. So it, if it doesn't work out as good as we might think, we could work out, we could work on our own pedagogy and promotion again, explain them the importance. So in fact, I would say we have achieved a little success in our first year using LinkedIn Learning Platform. As, we, as when we ask if the students are willing to use the platform again in their second year studies or in future studies, so there's a resounding yes to this question for various reasons, like for better CVs, or for the career paths, or their uh, opportunities, or um, for or quality content, and so on. Well, lastly, as a concluding remark, we're not here to promote just another new gadget or new technology. So this would not be just an technologically technology-centered teaching and learning. The use of this learning approach is to grant a certain control to the students in the curriculum to enable the decision-making process in the curriculum. So in most cases, they are passive learners. The platform allows them to choose what they learn. So um, we don't have make we might not have the brilliant, most talented, or most motivated students in our in our classes. But in fact, we might have we might have students who are lost, who um who do not have direction in their study or in their career. So they're so used to teachers' talk, a traditional way of uh, teaching and learning. So the use of this linking learning platform will be one baby step to promote self-directed learning, and it is a start to foster a culture of online self-learning or online self-directed learning. So that's it for our little pilot study. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Joyce and Ken. Um, and we do have a question for both of you. So how do you motivate students with low motivation to participate in self-directed learning? OK, so that's always come to me when I motivate students. And I guess, um, first of all, I can motivate them um, before that, uh, I can do a research or I can do a survey with the student and to talk, collect the data and also uh, to know more about the um, student uh, habit of learning. And also, um, I would also um, uh, want to know more about background, like, for example, the financial background, the family, so the family background as well, so that I can assign and uh, a learning outcome with them together and to achieve um, uh, e-learning as well. So at the same time, I guess um, 
I can also um, use a peer level um, interactions because this uh, always uh, is a really good motivator uh, for students in front of the student to share what they learned or what they watched before so that they can also uh, kind of like uh, encourage the students as well. Um, what else I guess? Um, maybe also uh, we can also uh, build up a habit for self-learning because this is only the way that um, students learn by themselves. And um, I believe the teacher will not involve too much actually for self-learning. So that's all for my answers, I guess. <laughs> thank you very much, Joyce and Ken. Please be seated. And thank you to all our guest speakers today again. I'm sure for those who have been listening to the four sharing sections intently, you probably may have some reflection in mind. We will now have a panel discussion on the learning experience of students in self-directed online learning. The discussion will be moderated by Dr. Larry Ching. Dr. Ching is the program director of OU Lee Pace. He obtained his doctorate from the University of Hong Kong with his research interest in experiential learning and e-learning. He's also the convener of the work Integrated Learning, a new technology in teaching and learning task group focusing on the facilitation of e-learning and dual-mode learning of students under the effects of COVID-19. We'll also have students' representatives joining us this afternoon. Let's welcome Juan from Tamaske Polytechnic in Singapore, Nithia from BAC Education in Malaysia, and Jay from OU Lipis. May I now invite Dr. Cheng and Jay onto the stage, please? Oh, thanks, Heidi. Uh, so in the previous sessions, um, Actually, we have a lot of great speakers who have just tried to share with us their views about how uh, online learning can be facilitated and also why they are so important. So I think that is the right time for us to change our focus a little bit and listen to what our students think uh, about online learning from the perspective as the end users. Okay, so uh, here I'm happy because I can see Jay is with us in the hall. And I can see we have Ron uh, from Singapore and we have uh, Livia from Malaysia as well in Zoom. So uh, Livia and Ron, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. So uh, I think maybe I can just start asking the first question. So um, as I'm so sure that you have experienced your learning no matter uh, in a traditional way of classroom setting or in online learning, so um, may I ask you to share uh, with us your story of uh, what kinds of learning platform, I mean online learning platform you have chosen so far in your learning experience, and also what are the likes and dislikes that you have in the learning process? How about Ran? Maybe you will be the first one to answer this question. Sure. Okay, so as for learning platform, uh, I've actually used it for LinkedIn Learning. And as for the likes and dislikes, uh, for this part, I think it's quite personal. So my opinion doesn't really represent the student population. So I, for my likes, I think it's online soft study actually uh, provides a lot more flexibility as I can learn at my own pace. I do not need to complete the lesson within one sitting and I definitely can plan my time better. And also because of this flexibility, there's a lesser chance for me to face burnouts while I learn. It's also definitely less stressful as compared to classroom learning because I do not need to catch up with the lesson space constantly. I can set the learning pace myself as and when I like. It is also not time constrained, nor location bound. So it's mm. very convenient. And I do not need to travel. All I have to do is just to switch on my laptop and yeah. whenever I have the time. I the see. Content, uh -huh. Yeah. The content might also not necessarily be related to school. I can enroll into online courses of my own interest. There's so many courses online for me that are available for me to explore. And I definitely have the power to choose whatever I want to learn. So that is my likes of online self studies. Mm. That Any said, dislikes? Yeah. Yeah. That being said, yeah, definitely some dislikes. Mm. So some of the lessons might end up not being engaging. So it's very difficult to focus because online self learning can only provide a certain level of interactivity. And but uh, I prefer to learn through hands on learning. So I might be slightly distracted as when it comes to online learning. But furthermore, there's also a it requires a lot of discipline and motivation to do online self-learning because there are a lot of distracting elements at home. Like any moment I'll be distracted by my phone just because of a single notification. Mm. Okay, thank you. So how about Lydia? So Lydia, are you here? Yes, Um, I actually, a lot of my likes and dislikes are very similar to uh, Ren. I also use uh, mainly LinkedIn Learning and uh, Coursera as well. 
my dislikes sorry my likes i'll start with my likes first um so like dr sam was saying earlier there there's a lot more autonomy given to us and we're more able to to explore the lesson more like more in depth because and it gives us more motivation to do it because we it's our it's on our time and mm. at our pace so it's definitely much more um liberating in that sense uh we can also go back to the recordings and the the lectures that we've already watched or the seminars and that helps as well because you can pause and then i tend to go do my own research and that 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 really helps with the understanding of the whole topic rather than rushing it through um during class and you're not able to digest it fully so and of course the fact that um it's it's done from the comfort of your own home that's an added benefit and it's it's quite nice to have that that you know i i can just go on to my computer um once i'm awake and learn whenever i want my dislikes would actually be the negatives of this pause function where we can come back to um the lesson after research that tends to elongate my my learning time and because i get very involved into the research of things it tends mm. to get a bit daunting so that's the first dislike the second is um i am one of those students that's always front row in class and i love asking questions and i love interacting with my teachers and my friends so i guess that that sort of the missing element but um bac has helped us a lot in that respect because we are able to interact quite quite efficiently and quite effectively with our lecturers and with our friends so it does it's not too bad mm i see so that means it actually would be a, a key reason that you think maybe online learning would be able to treat right yeah okay thank you so how about jay i think it's your turn to me online self study is more flexible than classroom learning because i can create my own study plan and manage my study time effectively without being constrained by the class schedule and i don't need to go back to campus very often so i can make good use of my time by studying at home and for example i can watch some educational videos for around 45 minutes then rest for 10 to 15 minutes and enjoy a cup of coffee while away and be ready for an hour for 45 minutes of learning um most importantly i will not be disturbed by others in addition i can learn to use different learning media through online self study such as zoom google classroom and linkedin learning i can even arrange a zoom meeting with classmates to discuss the project it enables us not to become technology literates and the only is this life of online self study self study is that i cannot immediately ask instructors questions and if i encounter the difficulties and problems and i cannot discuss it further with my classmate face to face Thank okay you. i see So it seems like that there are pros and cons of using online learning platform, right? So um, actually, I think this question is a bit hard. Uh, I mean, the second question is just assume that um, you have no choice now, okay? And you are required to use online learning as uh, part of your total learning experience, okay? So you may have the decision of how many percentage or in what percentage online learning should be at in your total learning time. So in this case, what would be the percentage that you think would be suitable for you and will make you feel more comfortable? Maybe I would say. So who would be the next one to ask this question? To, to answer this question, Ron or Olivia or Jay? Oh, I think I'll go first. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so for as for the percentage wise, I think online self learning should take about like a thirty percent of total learning time. And even though I would say online self learning is definitely less stressful and as of the benefits mentioned by our um, media now, but mm-hmm. I feel like we still cannot replace our uh, life learning like those or uh, less life lessons. I mean, yeah. So one example I will give like is that is more efficient to teach during classrooms than for online learning. So if whenever I meet the problems, so uh, 
I could just raise my hand in class and I will get my answer even clearly with a context that I can understand. But oh. for online learning, even whenever I'm into a problem, I have to do research myself or I can actually drop a comment. Like I can drop the question to the e-learning platform community, but that will take some time. So I can't really get my response immediately. Yeah, mm. And also, sometimes the response I get might be too complex for me to understand. So it will leave me even more confused. And this will definitely hinder my learning process because I need to do even more research because I have more questions. Mm. But, okay. despite that, but despite that, I still feel that the online self-study is still important because it allows me to explore and learn content at a less stressful rate so I can enjoy learning. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. So just assume that uh, COVID-19 is not a factor, so everything's go back to normal. And now the students can decide whether they would be able to choose to go back to school or they would prefer to stay at home to do the online one. So I, I just wonder, so in this case, which one would be your preference? Online learning or um, go back to school and have a classroom learning? I would prefer to have a hybrid of both because I think both, uh, both types of learning bring about their own benefits. Mm. So it's uh, good to have a balance between these two. I see. Okay. Uh huh. Or maybe we jump to the last question. Okay. So maybe Jay will be the first one to answer this question for me. So um, as we have heard the idea from uh, Dr. Chu saying that gamification can be one of the idea. So I just wonder, is uh, any other important element that can be added in the online learning platform or uh, in the content? So to make your learning more enjoyable in the online platform. So, Jay, would you mind to share? I think there are three elements that are quite important to me, um, including the video-based learning, uh, online exercise and quizzes, and also some discussion platforms. Um, it's just like LinkedIn Learning. I can search for videos related to various skills and subjects, instructed by experts from uh, different professions, and each video contains chapter creases and exercises, and there is also some uh, Q&A columns that allows learner and instructors to share ideas. I can find a lot of interesting ideas for my assignment reference from these uh, tour, and it makes my study more fruitful and enjoyable. Mm, I see. Actually, I like the concept of play uh, element as just mentioned by Roger. But uh, other than play, so I just wonder, is there anything else that we can add in the system? So how about Ron or how about Livia? Do you have any idea? Um, I, was, I, I would say one thing that we, we could um, improve on, I guess, is the since learning online quite is very different from learning uh, in a classroom. So it might be a bit better to reduce the, the length of the video so they're more bite-sized and more accessible for students. Because right now, if we have to sit through two hours or three hours of a video it, alone in our in our homes, it just seems a bit, it, it can get a bit tiresome. So reducing the length of the video to make it more bite-sized might, might help. I see. Okay. Uh, it sounds to me that uh, both the online channel or the traditional way of learning have their pros and cons. So um, instead of saying that uh, online learning can be placed, uh, the traditional way of learning totally. So I would say maybe both of the channels should coexist and actually they are supporting each other right now uh, in different situations. So um, the decision of whether online learning should be used more or less, I think it quite depends on a bundle of uh, factors here. For example, um, the, the subject nature maybe, or maybe the diverse background for students like their age, uh, like their learning culture, so on and so on. So I think that um, there's no conclusion, but I think that there should be a lot of things that the educators should think about uh, before they can make a decision of how much online learning should be used to have uh, what we call an ideal mix uh, to cater the needs of our students. So I think it is just a quick sum up that I can uh, have so far. So I think that's the end of this section. And I think I would like to thank Jay. I would like to thank Lydia and Ron to be here today with us. Okay. So that maybe I will pass the mic back to. Uh... <laughs> all right, Heidi. Thank you, Dr. Chang, for leading the panel discussion and to all the student representatives again. I'm sure those wonderful exchanges will benefit us all. We're now approaching the end of today's forum. May I invite Dr. Benjamin Chen? Dean of OU Lipes to give his closing remarks and wrap everything up. 
Dr. Chen, please. Uh, thank you, Heidi. Uh, VP, Professor Kwok, uh, Dr. Samuel Chi, Dr. Linda William, uh, Mr. Raja Singham, colleagues and participants in Hong Kong and across the ASEAN region, good afternoon. Uh, we have come to the end of the Academic Forum Series 4, motivating students for online self-learning. It has been our great privilege to have spent this afternoon together listening to the developments in online and student-led learning given by expert researchers and experienced educators from our own home city, Hong Kong, as well as Singapore and Malaysia. On behalf of OEHK Lipes, I would like to extend our sincere gratitude to the speakers and to our co-organizer, co Linkin, for bringing us here as a group, although in virtual presence. I believe we all share the same feeling that uh, motivating students to utilize online tools propel their studies would become an increasingly vital topic in the coming semester in view of the prevailing pandemic situation. This forum could not have been more timely we are at the juncture of preparing for the next academic year with almost two years of online teaching and learning experience under our belt. The experience shared by our speakers today will undoubtedly serve as resources and food for thought for us to strive for excellence in fostering students' self-directed learning. To begin with, Dr. G's presentation has covered the learning needs of students at different levels from primary to secondary. His proposition to implement gamification into education sheds light on the potential of a more multifaceted approach to classroom practice. Of course, achieving this would naturally require a higher level of digital literacy from both teachers and students. This has been reinforced by Dr. William, whose sharing has emphasized the importance and the urgency of keeping abreast about the increasingly popular adoption of data analytics in education. In the face of various uncertainties brought about by COVID-19 pandemic, one thing is certain, education will never be the same. Mr. Singham's ideal of next-gen education has provided us with some valuable insights into what could be a fertile ground for change. Lastly, our colleagues Joyce and Ken have investigated how online self-learning had actually been perceived by Lee Pace students. All these sharing sessions, as well as the panel discussion, have offered a much needed dialogue between educators and students in these technology-rich educational contexts that we have all become a part of. Now, the world is changing in an unprecedented manner, and education is no exception. It is essential for everyone to realize that the responsibility to adapt does not only fall on, educate, on educators' shoulders, but also those of students themselves. Hopefully, if not certainly, our guest speakers today have delivered a unanimous message, and that is the significance of motivating students to take full advantage of technology and learn on their own should not be overlooked. On this note, I would like to close this academic forum. May all of you have a great start and draw success as you encourage your students to take ownership of their learning through technology-assisted learning in the, in the coming academic year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Academic Forum Series 4, Motivating Students for Online Self-Learning has officially come to an end. Thank you once again to all of you for joining us this afternoon. Bye-bye. Yeah.